in this message, we're going to specifically look at the story of the Pharisee and the publican. And we're going to examine the two ways in coming to God to worship. And we're going to begin in Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. And the word of God says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We have first the Pharisee. He stood and prayed this with himself. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So this person considers himself elite, VIP. He's wholly self-satisfied. The Pharisee goes to worship because he's hoping to win commendation. Notice me. He's thinking, I'm standing by myself. The Pharisee goes to worship because he thinks it's an act of merit that will recommend him to God. He's not going to obtain anything from God. He comes without need. The Pharisee goes to worship because people will have a high opinion of his piety. And for those that can't see the PowerPoint, there is a picture of the Pharisee and the publican. And the Pharisee is, is sticking out his chest, putting in money into the, into the offering plate. The Pharisee's worship is prompted by self-interest. So let's look at this a little bit. Let's listen now to his prayer. And he says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So the Pharisee is going to worship with self-praise. He looks it. You can see those clothes. Nice clothes. He says he, he's probably saying he has those clothes because the Lord is blessing him. And how, how do we know he, he's dressing up in nice clothes? Well, Matthew 23, 27 talks about, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you're like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones. So, we know that the Pharisees appeared beautiful outward. So this Pharisee, he looks it. And he walks it. I don't know if you can see, but you see that chest. And, and you can just imagine uh, those, those confident, prideful people that have that walk. Um, or, or swagger. You know, you know that... You know the, the kind that I'm talking about, that, that proud walk. Well, this Pharisee, he walks it. And he prays it. He's thinking, I'm so thankful that I'm not as other men 
are. I'm way beyond other men. I'm in a class of my own. Now, we also know he prays that because Luke 20 verse 47 talks about the Sadducees and they, they, they make a show of long prayers. So you have this idea of, I want to be noticed. Well, in Christ Object Lessons, it talk, on page 150, it talks about that he judges his character, not by the holy character of God, but by the character of other men. This is how he judges his character. That's a problem. Not only that, he is thanking God. He's not professing that he, he made himself better than... Uh, he was actually willing to, to say to God, thank you, God. I thank thee. So he was willing to acknowledge God. And he says, I fast how much twice in the week I give tithes of all that I possess. So where is the Pharisees confidence? It's in the outward actions, but the religion of the Pharisee doesn't touch the soul. The Pharisee is not seeking godlikeness of character, a heart filled with love and mercy. He's interested in the outward appearances. And we have a little interesting point in the first uh, verse of this parable, verse nine. And the question is, who is the audience of Jesus? It says, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So this is his audience. They trusted in their righteousness. So you have a worship service with a man trusting in his own righteousness. The thought process, I'm doing everything right. Uh, I got this. It's the attitude of the Pharisee. The Pharisee goes to worship because he thinks he's righteous. He thinks, Lord, I'm a hundred percent surrendered to your will. At the same time, it says he despised others. So he thinks he's the cream of the crop and he didn't see anyone close to his attainment and he looks down upon others. Let's just go to Isaiah 65 quick, quickly. You can keep your, uh, keep a bookmark in, in Luke because we'll be coming back. But in Isaiah 65, here's an idea of this Pharisee. Uh, Isaiah 65, starting... Well, in verse five, and it says, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. So we'll stop there. That's come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. And it's interesting. It says, stand by thyself. And if we look, what is this Pharisee doing? He stood and prayed thus with himself. The Pharisee judges himself by other men. He looks, he looks on Zoom and he sees the people there and he says, I'm, I'm way better than that guy. I'm way better than that sister. And which also means the Pharisee judges other men by himself. 
So not only the Pharisee judges himself by other men, but the Pharisee judges other men by himself. And the worse people that he sees, the more righteous, by contrast, he appears in his eyes. So in a, in a, in a sense, the Pharisee has incentive for, for himself to despise others, right? The worse that he sees, the better that he feels. Brothers and sisters, there is no divine blessing when worshipers come with this spirit. Amen. There is no divine blessing. So let's take a look at the publican now. And with the publican, it's quite simple. The verse says, in the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven were in verse 13 luke 18 verse 13 but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful to me a sinner so he's standing afar off and the idea is that he saw himself unworthy to unite in their devotions he saw himself unworthy in fact, he thought him so unworthy that he, he wasn't even wanting to lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. The idea of self-abhorrence, he, he wasn't impressed with himself. He felt he had transgressed God's commandment, and he knew that he had no merit to commend him to God. He wouldn't even look up. Well, and now we get to hear his prayer. And his prayer is simple. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a cry of utter despair. No comparison with others. He's not comparing him like other people. He's saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. His mm -hmm. only desire is for pardon and, and peace, mercy. His only plea was the mercy of God. And the simple parable leaves us with the outcome. The outcome can be found in verse 14. And it says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth humbleth himself shall be exalted he went down to his house justified that word justified is the same word in revelation 22 11 where it talks he that is righteous, let him be righteous. Dikayo, let him be righteous still. And, and so we have that idea. He went down to his house justified rather than the other. The publican received the blessing. The Pharisee did not. And the principle we are left with is exalted shall be abased and the humble shall be exalted i don't know if you've ever seen this quote but it says two classes christ object lessons page 152 the pharisee and the publican represent two great classes into which those who come to worship god are divided so two great classes now let's look at an example in real life and for the first example we go to peter 
And in Christ Object Lessons, it says, for each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there's a lesson in the history of the apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee, in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. So here we see Peter in the beginning. He thought himself strong. And then what happened? Well, Christ Object Lessons continues on page 152. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him were blended, Peter understood himself. The quote continues, He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he repent his sin. He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance. And like the publican, he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. Amen. Can we say amen to this? Amen. He found pardon. So the question, what about you? What class are you in today? We have the privilege of worshiping every week. We come to worship and there are two great classes that we can be divided into. And Peter experienced both of them. What class are you in today? Now, this is a very clear uh, division between the Pharisee and the publican. But sometimes the temptations of the enemy are very subtle. I want to share a personal testimony with you that happened this week. I was tempted this week and it was a little thing, but what does the wisdom of God tell us about little things? Christ mm -hmm. object lessons, page 356 um, is a quote and it begins with Luke 16 verse 10 it says he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much the importance of the little things is often underrated because they are small but they supply much of the actual discipline of life there are really no non-essentials in the christian's life our character building will be full of peril while we underrate the importance of the little things. So the little things are important. And so here's what happened. There was prayer meeting on Tuesday. And the devotional thought I was planning on sharing was about the power of prayer. Well, during that day, it was a it was a busy day. There were a lot of things uh, that I was taking care of. And a few hours before prayer meeting, I received a phone call from my wife. She was in town. She was running late. And supper was not going to be ready at the normal time. So she asked if I could wash some potatoes, cut them up, and put them in the oven. Simple right? I said yes, hung up. And as I put the phone down, 
a struggle began in my heart. I told you I had felt rushed for time. And now I had another task to complete that I'm not very familiar with because I don't do a lot of cooking. I prepared the potatoes. And by the end of the preparation of those potatoes, my heart was unprepared for a prayer meeting. I was unsettled. I was annoyed. And it was just, it was something I wasn't expecting. And I was pressed for time. I don't think it was an unreasonable request. It just surprised me and selfishness sprang up at that moment. Well, fast forward, I'm now 10 minutes away from the start of prayer meeting to go on Zoom. I'm still unsettled. My plan is I'm going to talk about the power of prayer. I'm going to, to, to share a quote about prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the boundless resources of omnipotence and I'm struggling to be ready for prayer meeting. This is what I encountered this week. Five minutes before prayer meeting, I dropped on my knees and I cried out to my God for help and mercy, recognizing my utter inability to lead out in prayer meeting, saying, Lord, I want to talk about your um, omnipotence, the, the boundless resources of omnipotence in prayer. And I'm in need of help right now just to be able to to be at prayer meeting. I asked for wisdom from above. Prayer meeting started. And as it began, I realized I had two options. First option, pretend that everything has been fine all along. I have it all together and I'm in tip top shape. Don't say a word. Or two, I could share the experience of what I had just went through and testify that we can never safely put confidence in self or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. I decided for option two and I shared my experience. You see, there was a desire for me to guard my looks. See the Pharisee? He likes his looks. He thinks it's quite nice. I wanted to guard my looks. There was a temptation to do that. There was a temptation to guard my strength. I wanted to be looked upon as strong. I also wanted to be looked upon uh, to guard my reputation, right? That. None of these small things bother me. I, I'm strong. I, I have a strong relationship. Well, I can say this. Second Corinthians 12.10 says, When I am weak, then I am strong. And I shared the struggle with those in prayer meeting. And I tell you that it was a sweet spirit of fellowship and testifying that I wish every person here was there. And it opened up the door to share more and testify. And we came to a place of, I just say it was sweetness. Uh, and I was just praising the Lord. Mm -hmm. There was a struggle to protect myself and not share how needy I really 
was. But is that the example I want people to follow? So when they come onto prayer meeting, do I want them to like put on their makeup and say everything is a okay? We want a real experience with worshiping God, and we serve a wonderful God. We serve a God that is worthy of worship, and who has promises for us that we can rely on, even when we're struggling. In our day, for example, Isaiah twenty-seven verse five says, "Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me." Notice that it says, "My strength, not Jason's strength." I wanted to try to guard my strength, but what is my strength? It really is nothing. I need the strength in Isaiah twenty-seven verse five. Or how about Isaiah forty verse twenty-nine? He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Can I glory in my weakness, that that I can see the power in Christ and give and give praise to Him, recognizing that He is my strength. Amen. We also have this other promise, First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We want real worship, brothers and sisters. We don't want an outward appearance. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah three thirteen. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. That thou hast transgressed against the Lord, thy God. There's more. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Ezekiel thirty six twenty five. Here's a quote from Christ Object Lessons. But we must have a knowledge of ourselves. A knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. Look at that picture. No conviction of sin. But we need a knowledge of ourselves. The quote continues: The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in a self-righteous armor, which the arrows of God, barbed and true aimed by angel hands, failed to penetrate. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. He came to heal the broken-hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised, Luke four eighteen, but they that are whole need not a physician. We must know our real condition, or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger, or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the wound, the pain of our wounds, or we should not desire healing. My real condition was something I was ashamed of, but the Lord can help in our weaknesses, in our pains, and in our real condition. We don't need to be fake. And I'm so grateful for this parable. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of Himself. In his church, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. This looks out of context. I put this in here because we know there are two great classes that come to worship God, and the person on the left 
doesn't look like a person in a sense that's going to be an end time person. Many times I think 144,000, the, the thought process is, is we, we need to, we need to look really, really good. And this quote is going to take place. The character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. But which one of those people is going to have that verse? Which one? Is it the one on the right, the Pharisee, or the one on the left, the publican? My answer is the one that went home justified. That's the one. Christ Object Lessons, page 159. It's not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. Heartbreaking confessions of sin, humbling of the soul before him. That's the person on the left. That's the publican. It's not only at the beginning of our Christian walk. I've had people say, uh, who were involved with ministry. Uh, I didn't work with them, but there were some ministries that, that wanted me to proclaim, uh, proclaim that I have it, that, that I have it. He wanted me to proclaim that, that, I have the victory. And he wanted me to say those words. It, it really looks like the person on the right that would say those words. The nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly would di we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. The apostle Peter became a faithful minister of Christ and he was greatly honored with divine light and power. He had an active part in the upbuilding of Christ's church, but Peter never forgot the fearful experience of his humiliation. His sin was forgiven, yet well he knew that for the weakness of character which had caused his fall, only the grace of Christ could avail. He found in himself nothing in which to glory. Brothers and sisters, let's not flatter the man. Let's not praise the man. Let's not praise, uplift the minister. I don't want to end up like the guy on the right and praise the Lord that we don't need to i am praying that we would come each sabbath with confession of sin with repentance with a recognition of our need and that we would come seeking a divine blessing not just a thank offering like cain did but a thank offering and the blood, the blood of the lamb in recognition of our great need, the sacrifice of Christ. I was encouraged in my weakness because God turned my weakness and, and gave me a blessing uh, at that prayer meeting. And I was so grateful because I was tempted to go down the road 
of the Pharisee. It's so easy, brothers and sisters, and even for ministers, it's so easy to go down the road of the Pharisee. I pray that the Lord would continue to help us worship in spirit and in truth. For those that can, would you kneel with me as we close for a word of prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, you're wonderful. You are worthy of praise. You are our creator, and we want to worship you. We want to be ready for heaven. Father, we want to flee, and, and, and we don't want sin, Father, and we ask for help. We are so in need, Father, and I just pray that you would continue to help us have this confession when we need it, and that we wouldn't hide ourselves from from not only people but from you that we could be real and that we could have an experience that people know that people would know that we have been with jesus and that we wouldn't take any of the glory or the praise but that we would return it unto you through your son and so father i just pray for your spirit to continue to work I pray, Father, that if there's anyone that has sins and is hiding, that they can confess it to you. They, they, could, they could have time with you and that your healing hand would be upon them. They would know the forgiveness of sin, the wonder of pardon and mercy, and that sweet peace that you bring to those that seek it. Father, we come seeking and we also come praising because we know your promises are sure and your words are true. We, we are in good company when we are with Jesus. Thank you, Father. It is to his merits we look to, and we thank you and praise you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.